Well, my goodness, what a gift to worship with both communities of Good Shepherd and Transfiguration. Um, such, such a great thing to see the spirit of collaboration in ministry and worship with you. And I pray that continues and deepens over time because so often in congregational life, it can feel like you're always on your own. And it doesn't have to be that way as you're learning. There is such potential for strength and renewal in these kinds of partnerships. And I hope you will share with others what you are learning about worshiping um, together in this time. I'd like to, I'd like to begin uh, simply by acknowledging uh, the times we're living in and all that's happened in the past year and indeed in the past two weeks. We were being asked to hold a great deal and some of us are being asked to hold more than others. And the meaning we will take away when we look back on this era is beyond our knowledge now, but I do believe this, that how we live now really matters so that we and others will look back with gratitude for our actions and our witness now. So I'd like to thank you I'd like to thank you for all that you're doing to help keep the virus in check with your uh, masks and distancing and shifting so much of your lives to screen gatherings. This is not easy. The illness has taken its toll as have our efforts to contain it. And I thank you, all of you for persevering in this hard time. I'd also like to thank you for your part, doing your part in lending a helping hand in ways large and small to other people, because truth be told, we, we need each other. And it's often harder to be on the receiving end in times like this, especially for those who've never needed help before. But if we've learned anything through this pandemic is that we human beings are communal beings and we need each other in the giving and receiving of help. And in doing so, we we draw closer, we build bonds between us through which God's grace can flow. So I thank you for your part in persevering in love. Thank you for your commitment to justice and all the ways you strive for justice and the dignity of every human being. And lastly, but not least, thank you for your prayers, for your gathering in weekly prayer and for your private prayers in the silence of your hearts. I was speaking to a, a grief counselor recently, and she said something that caught my attention. She, she said that she believed that we are living now through one of the most sacred and holy times in all of human history. And I have to confess that those were not words that occurred to me to use in describing 2020 or even these first weeks of 2021, but she was adamant. She said, think of all the ways our hearts have been broken open and how vulnerable we've had to be in new ways. And we are all praying like never before. And I'd like to speak to you this morning about, about prayer. I'm taking my inspiration from the passages from scripture today, particularly the story of the boy Samuel and Psalm 139. Um, and in closing, in keeping with the remembrance of Dr. Martin Luther King, I will share a story from his life that inspires me to persevere in prayer. But first, let me ask you, just on a scale of one to 10, and you don't have to answer this out loud, of course, because I, but just in your own mind, on a scale of one to 10, how would you rate the, the quality, the satisfaction you feel in your life of prayer. And the reason I ask is that for many people, and I include myself among them, the topic of prayer can often evoke uh, feelings of um, inadequacy, of doubt, of skepticism. Um, all kinds of questions emerge the minute we attempt to pray. Um, I consider myself not an expert, but a learner in prayer, and it's in that posture that I speak to you. Now, I know well for some, and perhaps this is true for you, that the practice of prayer comes easily and is an established part of your lives. 
one of the women who helps care for my mother in our home comes to mind for me. Um, she rises every morning at 5 a.m. for a set time of prayer. When she arrives at our house throughout the day, she's always listening to an audio recording of scripture. And at night, she meditates. And I am in complete awe of her. But the majority of people I speak with, and I mean, and this is including um, clergy, uh, we, we often um, struggle with our um, prayers. And there's a feeling of um, anxiety and even guilt when we talk of our prayers. I mean, maybe this isn't true for you, but it might be for some. I can tell you it's also true for bishops. A few weeks ago, I was on a video call with bishops across the country and our presiding bishop, Michael Curry, had invited the, one of the former presiding bishops, Frank Griswold, to speak to us about prayer. And the first thing he said to us, bishops all, and I think he was just channeling something. He said that we needn't feel ashamed if we were struggling in prayer right now. And he reminded us that we all tend to define prayer as an activity that we initiate ourselves, much as we might practice the piano or take up an exercise discipline. And he encouraged us, and I, I share this with you, he encouraged us to turn that thinking around in recognition that any effort you and I make to pray is preceded by something that God has initiated within us. And for emphasis, uh, Bishop Griswold quoted a famous passage from St. Paul's letter to the Romans. You may be familiar with this when Paul writes, likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words and God who searches the heart knows what is in the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. What an overwhelming relief Griswold said to all of us to be told by none other than St. Paul himself that we don't need to know. We, we, none of us knows how to pray as we ought. In fact, and here's the point, we pray best in our weaknesses because the spirit draws upon those weaknesses to bring us closer to Christ. And even our inability to pray to our own satisfaction can be an invitation to bypass self-judgment and be available for grace. And that, Griswold said, is the simplest way to think about prayer in terms of our availability to God. So think for a moment with me what it feels like to be available. When are you available for someone? What does it take for you to be present, to slow down enough in the context of prayer to receive rather than perform your prayers? So let's turn back now to, to scripture, beginning briefly with Psalm 139, which was read for us so well, because it underscores everything that uh, the bishop was saying about prayer beginning with God. Um, and by the way, this, this, this Psalm 139 is, a, is an integral part of a faith curriculum for adolescents in the Episcopal Church known as Rite 13. And it's really a wonderful Psalm to share with young people in that incredibly formative time of life. It's also a good one to have committed to memory when you are uh, looking for words to pray. So here, here the first part again, just think of it as this vulnerability before God. Lord, you have searched me out and known me. You know, you know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You trace my journeys and my resting places and are acquainted with all my ways, there is not a word on my lips, but you, O oh Lord, know it all together. Now, there's a part we didn't read this morning, which is also really powerful. And I'm just going to read this part to you because I just want you to hear it. The psalmist then says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I climb up to heaven, you are there. 
If I make the grave my bed, you are there also. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there, your hand will lead me and your right hand hold me fast. And if I say, surely the darkness will cover me and light around me turn to night, darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light to you are both alike. And the Psalm continues as we heard read, for you created me in my inmost parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I thank you because I am marvelously made. Your works are wonderful and I know it well. See this ancient prayer just puts us in a posture of complete openness before God. And it's similar to the prayer with which we began, began this morning. We began almost every Sunday morning in prayer. Oh God, to you, all hearts are open. All desires known from you, no, no secrets are hid, right? We can only be vulnerable before God in prayer because we already are, whether we're aware of it or not. God has already searched us out and known us and loves even the parts of ourselves that we struggle to love. So think of that if you can, if you might, as you pray that utter availability from God's side to us already before we even try any reaching out from our side and the fact that God already knows us completely and fully. And then turning now to the story of the young boy, Samuel, which for me I, I, is among the most helpful passages about prayer in the entire Bible. And it begins with an astonishing statement of context. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. So this was a hard time. And it was a lean time spiritually when those who were even, even those who were seeking God's will were feeling alone and adrift. And in this lean desert time, a boy hears a voice call his name. And his teacher, of course, didn't call. And after being woken up three times by the boy, his teacher, Eli, <laughs> figures out what's happening, sends the boy back to bed with these words, which if nothing else, I hope you take with you today, speak. Lord, for your servant is listening. I wonder if you might just repeat those words with me now. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And that can be our prayer, yours and mine, every day, wherever we are, as we're sitting quietly or we're taking a walk or we're cleaning the house, doing chores, driving to the grocery store or to work. Now it's best to turn off all our devices that speak to us in our ears when we're praying this prayer, to cultivate again that sense of availability before God. But, but hear this too. Uh, this is a quote from a, a seasoned prayer named Don John Chapman. He, he says to us, pray as you can and don't try to pray as you can't. In other words, do, do your best. Take yourself as you find yourself and start from there. So, as I promised, let me end now with a story from Martin Luther King. And he tells the story about a pivotal moment in his life, a pivotal moment of prayer, um, when he prayed as he could and started where he was. And, and this, this happened early in his public ministry. It was in 1956, uh, it was a cold January night around midnight, and he had been up all night because he couldn't sleep for worry and fear. This was at the peak of the Montgomery bus boycott that he had helped to organize to protest segregation in public transportation, an effort that had dragged on far longer than anyone had, had anticipated. It had now been going on for over a year. Um, he knew that as a leader, he was in way over his head. I mean, he was 27 years old. Everyone around him was exhausted. The strategy didn't seem to be working. And he was afraid. And he had good reason to be afraid because he had received numerous abusive calls and death threats targeting him and his family. And the latest call had come a few days before with this voice assuring him that 
he would be sorry if he and his family didn't leave Montgomery within a week. And that night, he said, with his head in his hands, Martin Luther King bowed over his kitchen table and he prayed. And later he said that his prayer started something like that. He said, Lord, I'm, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I'm taking a stand for what I believe is right. People are looking to me for leadership. And if I stand before them without strength and courage, they will falter. But I'm at the end of my powers. I have nothing left. And I have come to the point where I can't, can't, I can't do it alone. And in that moment, he would later say he, he experienced a divine presence in his life as he never had before. And it was as if he could hear a voice say, stand firm, Martin. I'm with you and I will never leave you. Trust your instincts and carry on. And he rose from his table, ready to face another day. And I can't help but believe that a part of God's word to you this morning and to me is something similar, something like, stand firm. I will never leave you. Trust your instincts and carry on which isn't to say that all our instincts are accurate and should be acted upon, but that God will speak to us and guide us through our inner lives. And that we can trust that when God, when God needs to get our attention, God will speak. And we need to be available to listen. Now, if you don't hear anything when you pray, that happens to me a lot, actually, then take the silence as God's word perhaps to trust your instincts or to wait or to ask for help or to simply keep going. I'm not assuming that you don't have a prayer practice now. If you do, as you do, I encourage you to keep firm in that. Should your prayer practices have waned a bit in recent days or months, I invite you to join me in this one, setting a brief amount of time each day aside simply to acknowledge that you are before God and that God sees and knows everything about you. And then hold before God all that's on your mind and heart. And then after you've done that, to stop. And in a moment and a posture of availability say, along with Samuel, and you can say it with me now if good you- hear, I, Good to hear Malcolm. Good to see you, Malcolm. Thank Lord, Malcolm. Malcolm. For your servant is listening. Amen.